Welcome to Conversations with IU Northwest Community Partners. My guest today is uh, Mr. James Wallace, is our IU Northwest Director of Diversity. Welcome, Mr. Wallace. Thank How are you? you? For me. I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have a few questions for you, so I'm going to uh, start with the presentation. First, let me give you a little bit of background and what uh, started these conversations. So we are facing unprecedented times and following the death of Mr. George Floyd in police custody, the voice of protesters can be heard in all our communities in the United States and abroad. Mr. Floyd, an African-American man in his 40s, was identified by the Minneapolis police as a suspect in a case that involved the forging of a $20 bill. Today, we want to hear from experts on diversity and community relations, and uh, I'm very pleased that you could join us today because uh, who better than Mr. James Wallace uh, um, could be the voice for diversity. Um, I want to tell our listeners that you are the director of IU Northwest OJIMA, which is the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Multicultural Affairs, so it's a very important office, especially now. You're going to have a lot of work to do uh, to help us out at IU Northwest. So I want to ask you, uh, the first question would be just about uh, telling us, t tell us about yourself and how you decided to become a leading figure of an important diversity office such as the one at IU Northwest. Well, uh, thank you again for having me. And, um, you know, I'm sort of a homegrown product of IU Northwest. Uh, I, I joined the uh, Brother to Brother program. It was called SAB, the Student African American Brotherhood, back in 2008 when I was an undergraduate. And upon graduation, uh, I worked within the Office of Diversity, um, you know, for my predecessor, and I helped uh, coordinate the new student success program to help support incoming uh, students to the university, help them to get acclimated. Um, I did that for a while, and then uh, ultimately I was offered my current position and you know now I'm in a position to you know not only monitor some of the data related to student performance and disparities and things of that nature but engage in community um, engagement uh, working with folks in the community who want to do things on our campus and and leading conversations around diversity and inclusion so uh, I'm really you know proud to be here in, in Northwest Indiana and doing this work and we are so proud to have you at your Northwest. And I think it's, a, it's great when you say you're homegrown because you understand the challenges of the community. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why I thought that you'd be the best voice for this interview. So let me start with that. Um, my question is, in our conversation, we're focusing on the death of George Floyd and many other people who died because of police brutality. Do you think that those situations actually could happen in our own community? Yes, indeed, I do. And in fact, they have happened. Uh, within the last year, I'll say, there have been you know, three or four such um, situations where police have killed citizens. Uh, in the city of Gary alone, um, you know, just last week, there was a, a state police officer that was involved in a shootout on I-65 where an individual was killed. Um, you know, but, but, you know, one of the, the incidents that was closestly related to what happened to George Floyd was Melvin Buller, an 82-year-old man um, who was killed by the police in Gary while he was sitting in his car. And, you know, you know, there's speculation as to whether or not he had a hearing impairment and could hear the um, commands of the officer. Uh, but but no information has been shared with the community with regard to what's happening with that, the investigation. And I think that is the kind of thing that frustrates folks uh, when these sorts of things happen. So you know, can it happen in our community? Yes. Yes, it can. And it's, it's happening, right? So uh, this brings us to the next question. What can be done to improve the relationship between the police and the community? Well, I think uh, approaching that, you know, it's a complicated answer. I think that there's things that need to happen in the community where the police won't necessarily be needed to intervene. And I think that there's things that the police officers 
or the police can do in general um, to sort of mitigate some of these circumstances, you know, focusing on the community first, you know, there's an increased need for education, recreation, economic development for underserved, for people in underserved communities, period. Um, you know, there's social conditions that lead to, you know, the kinds of behaviors that cause the police to have to intervene. And those have to be addressed first and foremost. Um, so, so I'll just put a period there. Um, I think that, um, you know, there has to be a commitment from the communities themselves to want to live in crime-free zones mm -hmm. where, you know, they are for all intents and purposes policing themselves. They can't just, you know, allow, you know, lawlessness and things to happen in your community and then, you know, get mad when the police are called to, to deal with it and then get mad with the way that they deal with it. You know, communities have to police themselves. We have to have folks, you know, within their own families talking to each other um, and addressing some of those concerns before it even gets to that level. From the police standpoint, I think that, you know, the de-escalation training is certainly important, but ultimately there has to be a sense of accountability from police departments. I think that, you know, the global unrest that we see right now is because these things keep happening um, and the officers, you know, are basically not held to account for whatever it is that they do. Even with the advent of video cameras, they've been videoing these things since the Rodney King verdict, where it was as plain as day that this man was being abused by the police. But, you know, ultimately the verdicts came out, they were not guilty, and then it was a riot in L.A., and um, yeah, in 92. So we've been dealing with this for well over um, 20 some years and, you know, nothing has changed and people in the community see this, they're frustrated. And, you know, this recent wave of police officers being fired and folks resigning, um, even that I don't think is the solution. You know, there has to be an understanding of what your role is and even more than that, it has to be an appreciation or a valuing of the lives of these people. Mm -hmm. You know, the foundation of this country, you know, black people were currency. And, you know, I think that's part of it. I think that's, that's, that's part of the issue. People are viewed as currency and not necessarily as people. So, you know, if they're currency, then they're expendable. And, um, I think that's just that's something that has to be discussed within police departments and how they approach, how they deal with the public. Um, you know, other things, you know, from the accountability standpoint, citizen review boards are important. You know, and transparency is also important. You know, a lot of times these videos are not released or they're edited when they're released only to show what people do that is bad as opposed to what the police officers have done. But recently we've seen some videos where police are either planting drugs or saying things that are you know, unconscionable uh, to people and about people. Um, you know, we need to have more transparency so that some of those officers that are committing these acts can be weeded out and others know that that type of behavior is not gonna be tolerated. Very good, James. Um, a lot of the things to say um, are things we need to reflect on. Um, but I'm sure that uh, there are things that we can do as a university. And so I'm going to ask you this question. What do you think, uh, what do you think we can do at IUN to create a better world for our students and their families? Well, there's a couple of things that I think that the university can do. Um, because we're in the business of educating global citizens who are engaged in their communities and are working to make those communities better. So, you know, academically, I think that the project-based learning where our students are, you know, working in the community and, you know, in close proximity to people that are perhaps different from them will help break down some of those barriers that produce some of the prejudices that we observe from time to time. I think that's vitally important, particularly, you know, in education, you know, in the school of education or, you know, when people are working in schools, because a lot of the teachers that are in these schools are young white teachers, white female teachers who perhaps don't have exposure 
to males of color and then they see certain behaviors that cause them um, alarm and then they respond with discipline and that leads those students on that road to the school to prison pipeline um, because they're removed from the classroom and you know there's all sorts of other fallout from those um, from those type of um, situations um, but I think that when people are working together and living together then they start to understand each other and you won't have those kinds of misunderstandings that you know we've been seeing in the news so I think that's one of the one of the benefits that can come from that project-based learning not only that but the students will be exercising what they've learned in the classroom in the field in real time gaining that experience that is so valuable um, another thing I think that the university can do is develop a database of community resources to meet the needs of underserved populations um, you know, and I'm not just talking about students on campus but community members as well we need to be we're a public institution we need to be that resource um, that can help direct folks to um, the things that they need you know to survive especially in a community like Gary when you think about South Bend you immediately think of Notre Dame mm -hmm. and they're engaged in their community when you think about Evanston Illinois where I'm from you think about Northwestern mm -hmm. you know, when folks think about Gary they should think about IU Northwest and we should be engaged in the community in a similar way um, I think another thing that we can do is embrace the idea of general education courses focused on diversity and inclusion um, for all students, for all degree programs. I think that, 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 that it should include a critical examination of U.S. history and an examination of, um, you know, the dynamics, you know, this white meritocratic patriarchy that benefits and sustains systemic oppression. Absolutely. That should be that should be a part of everyone's education, uh, particularly in um, an institution like ours, which is which is the most diverse campus, you know, in the IU North, in the IU system. Period, if not the entire state. Um, and I think that we could implement on campus a campus-wide um, effort for training on unconscious bias awareness and mitigation, bystander intervention, um, and then just just plain civility. You know, we need to exhibit the, the traits that we want to see in others. And it needs to be part of, an intentional part of what we do as a university. And I think that if we do those things, we can be that institution where, you know, we're doing what we need to do to not only educate our community, but make our community a better place. That sounds great. And also, um, I want to remember what, um, Dr. Harry said yesterday at a town hall meeting when she said it's not enough to have the most diverse campus of IU, but you also want to retain those uh, um, the, the kind of diversity you want to support uh, people who come from diverse backgrounds. Uh, so not just having them, but also providing the, uh, all the uh, programs they are needed to support those individuals. This is what James, um, do you have anything to add? Um, you know, nothing more. I'm just glad to have the opportunity to speak with you today and, and share my thoughts, <laughs> such as they are. Thank you so much. And your thoughts are very valuable. So I look forward to working with you in the future. Yes, indeed. Take good care. <laughs>